This episode is sponsored by this Naked Mind companion app. Wait, this Naked Mind has an app? Yes, we do. And I am so excited to tell you about it. This Naked Mind companion app is our brand new app where we've included all-in-one access to over 700 videos with answers to all your burning questions, our signature 30-day alcohol experiment, our incredible global community, and so much more. All in one convenient place. It's private, off social media, and free. This Naked Mind companion app is available in the App Store, on Google Play, and online at thisnakedmindapp.com. This is Annie Grace, and welcome to This Naked Mind podcast, and I'm here with Maxi. Maxi? Yes, Maxi. Yeah. How are you? I'm good. I'm really good. Yeah, I took the day off to do this, actually. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. That's so great. So I feel, I'm feeling good about having a full day as well, so that's nice. <laughs> oh, that's so good. little bonus, little treat for yourself. For yeah. Me. Awesome. I thought so, yeah. <laughs> Very cool. So why don't you sort of take us back to the beginning in your relationship with alcohol? Where did it all start for you? It, it goes way back. I mean... I, th I think it's pretty common in Australia for like teenagers to like really involve themselves in drinking like really early. Um, but for me, it was like high school, you know, probably 16 years old, maybe like 16, 17 years old and just like drinking on the weekends with friends. But um, it, de it, was de it was like crazy from the start, you know. <laughs> It was like one liter bottles of absolute vodka. I have photos of myself like drinking like uh, your conversions are different, but it's a big, big bottle of, yeah. of straight vodka. And that's all I drank at these parties. And um, yeah, so it kind of started there. And I'm a musician. I like played in a lot of bands growing up. Um, so it was always like, you're always in pubs and clubs and venues and there's always alcohol there and you know like in some gigs we're getting paid in beers you know or you know you have a rider so it was it was just like always there that's kind of like where it began for me uh, and did you like it right away you know what I did and like I, I still don't hate alcohol um I uh, have like no problems that I had so much fun drinking I, I really did and that like I guess that sucks but I guess it's a good no, thing I don't know like, whatever your experience I don't know it's the truth you know the truth yeah. is I, I had a lot of fun during those years of like drinking and I and I hadn't developed like a, a problem with it yet so you know I, I guess when you hear people say um normal drinkers right <laughs> that's kind of what I was you know I, I, I it didn't affect my life at all and, and I I really enjoyed it just as much as a lot of people do um and that you know like that 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 stayed like consistent for, for years like for a long time I'm only 28 now um but you know from my entire early 20s I I, I Drinking wasn't an issue for me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah what did that look like? Sorry. <laughs> what so What were you doing? You're in a band, and what was? Yeah, I mean, like... I was I was in a band. I was in a folk band. I played the banjo. It was pretty fun. <laughs> um, and like, yeah, I mean, we we would we would play. We would rehearse during the week, and and we. would or it was a big bus, you know, what these old folk bands are like. We just can't seem to get enough musicians on stage. Um, and so there's there quite a few of us and we we drink at rehearsals, we drink beers, you know, we go play gigs. Often I was playing on stage pretty drunk and um, and we were, we, like, we were kind of a big band. We were playing big venues, but like, you know, I would definitely go home some nights being like, guys, I don't even remember half of what we played. I think we were fantastic. I'm, I'm <laughs> sure we were amazing, but I don't really remember. Um, it, never, it never really bothered me. I guess it was just like, that's what everyone did. 
you know. Um, wasn't really rubbing shoulders with a lot of people in sobriety or <laughs> yeah. Um, people so everybody who, in the bands was the same. Everyone, everybody. Um, you know, like I can't even. I really can't even think of one or two people that didn't drink. You know, um, and as I, I got a bit older, I moved into DJing and playing more in clubs and things like that, and obviously. There's a huge drinking culture there in the clubs um, and there's definitely like a more serious kind of drinking that people were drinking for days and days. So that was like a, a huge, a huge part of experience with alcohol. I, I guess over the last few years, what, what like what it's really been is, is, more, is more of an indulgence, like a, like a respectful indulgence, you know, like I, I lived in all these beautiful cities around the world and often like you go out and you you know you're making all these new friends and you're having these beautiful conversations and like really like progressive incredible conversations maybe you know like not far off the lane of sobriety even <laughs> um but they're all, they're always fueled by alcohol like always and that's kind of where it sat for me over, over the last few years until it really I took a time. You lived all over the place. I lived, uh, yeah, I've always wanted to escape. I don't know, I don't know why. <laughs> Melbourne is very far from um, the rest of the world. And, um, you know, I th people say that Australians have the crazy travel bug. It's totally true. We're always flying around the world. Yeah, I, I lived in, I moved to London when I was, when I was like, Early, in my early 20s, after I finished university, I got an incredible opportunity to work at a recording studio there um, and just like gunned it. I had no money. I was like sleeping in hostels, even like the bag rooms at hostels sometimes because I had no money and I was working in this insanely famous recording studio <laughs> and just pretending like I was, I was fine. I know I was fine. But yeah, I lived in London for a few years music for film and tv that's my job and london was an amazing place for that that took me to copenhagen i lived there for a little while and then a few trips back to australia but i eventually ended up in paris and um that was a couple of years ago just before the pandemic and that's when i started to notice my drinking like really take a step up mm. you know in in paris i could catch public transport everywhere I didn't have to drive <laughs> um and this is a real beautiful thing about the French culture of like waking up and having a glass of wine in the morning and all these like romantic ideas that I adored like I, I really loved um but it, it was like really normalizing alcohol at any time of the day Mm -hmm. which eventually probably wore off on me and became a really big problem <laughs> Yeah. I remember being in Paris and yeah, just everywhere and even, yeah, everywhere, just so much drinking. And I remember yeah. having an experience in New York too, like, oh, look at this. You never have to drive anywhere. So it doesn't matter how you can always just, you know, get a cab or ride the subway home, no matter how drunk. Interesting. Yeah. It's, it's, it's wild. Uh, I can't even imagine um, would it be like driving a car there but <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it definitely opened like you know like it made it a lot more accessible and um, kind of re removed those like pillars that I had back at home of being like oh well I have to drive home and you know or I'm probably gonna have to stay at this person's house or you know it just made it way too easy I think yeah yeah so what yeah. happened next well, obviously, I mean, I'm sure you're getting bored of listening to people who start talking about the pandemic and how that affects oh, no. their <laughs> relationship with alcohol. But, um, yeah, the pandemic happened. Uh, the French government cancelled my visa um, and, and, and sent me back to Australia. Um, and that was cool. I didn't know how long it was going to last, so I didn't really think too much of it. But when I got back to Australia, you know, um, 
quickly I was in lockdown and I don't know if you know, Melbourne had like one of the most severe lockdowns. I don't know, it's, we're, probably, we're probably just being cruel to ourselves or something. <laughs> it, was, it, was a, it was a very intense lockdown. Like you couldn't uh, leave five kilometres, which is like a few miles from your house. There was a curfew, you know, you couldn't, you had to be home by a certain time. I think it was like 5 p.m. You could only leave once a day to get groceries. It was like, it was, it was quite intense. And in Paris, I, had, I was in what felt like a new city. I didn't have that many friends. I couldn't make any new ones because I was stuck in lockdown. And yeah, I just, I just started using, I do think I started using alcohol as a bit of a clutch. Or just time killer. Like I had, you know, I was still I was still motivated in parts of my life. I, I bought a piano and uh, was playing that every day. But it was yeah, it quickly got to like 10, 11 in the morning, and I'm just kind of like, all right, um, when's an appropriate time to have a drink? And that's kind of when I first started noticing like that I was starting to use it to get to sleep. Uh, as like a distraction to get to sleep. I guess what I didn't, what I hadn't mentioned that during that time I, I, I was also developing, and I hope it's okay to share with you, but I was developing a, a really uh, horrible eating disorder. I, I think I, and I, experienced, I had experienced health problems in my life and uh, earlier on, and this is real gross, but I'm just going to tell you anyway, yeah, because oh. I think people need to hear this and like, especially with men, um, you know, like when I was, and I know a lot of people get to eating disorders in many different ways, but for me, I had, uh, you know, like this hereditary condition where I get reflux after eating and basically I'd get like, whenever I felt full or like I'd eaten, like overeaten or just like satisfied myself properly, the food would start coming back up and it was like kind of gross. And, you know, often I didn't want it on my breath or anything like that. Um, and I experienced like some early onset, like kind of elements of, of bulimia. Um, and it was just like, my body was just going through this. I had no conscious decision. And then that just got more and more serious over the years. And then through, so through this lockdown period, um, I was bored, I was cooking a lot, but I was, you know, purging every single meal and it got worse and worse and worse and worse. And I don't, I don't know if you know much, a lot about um, eating disorders, you probably do by now, but um, they can leave you feeling really uncomfortable and like really bloated and I didn't really know what was going on and I was trying to feel my body, but every time I ate, I felt so bloated that I just had to be sick. And, and it was just, I just felt really trapped in this. And that progressed, that definitely progressed a lot through that lockdown period. And were um, you living alone? I was living with like one housemate and they had a partner and there was a clause where you could go to your partner's house. So they were never there. <laughs> um, but I was very much like, you know, and there was something inside me that knew that this was wrong and I was hiding it for myself and and uh, ever, everyone else. But it was just kind of what I felt was just part of my life. Lockdown ended and I moved to Byron Bay. And this is this is like where it all went crazy. I don't know, do you know Byron Bay? I don't know if so you know it. My mom lives in Byron Bay. Your mom lives in Byron Bay. Mm -hmm. Wow. Wait, do yeah. I know her? She was part time here. So during the pandemic, she was here. She was here when yeah. so her husband was there. And she was so they she's there now. She's in Byron Bay now, but she they they spent many years apart because of how intense lockdown was in Australia. She couldn't come. So yeah. But. It's a be it's a beautiful place. It has its ups and downs, but but basically going back to Paris wasn't an option anymore and got in my car. And I, I, I managed to pick up a dog during lockdown. Oh, <laughs> me too. I don't know if you can see her. She's lying on the bed behind me. <laughs> Thank Billy. you. Very sweet. Um, I'm very lucky. 
we we got in the car and I was like one of the first people over the border as it opened. I just like had to get out. Nice life up in Byron Bay. It's really pretty. It's very active. It's really outside. But slowly, like, and well, not yeah. It's just very very involved with drinking there. You know, mm-hmm. you're always at the pub socially. You're always um, drinking alcohol, and yeah, it just became more and more every day, every day, every day. And because I wasn't. I was only just working for myself at that point. I didn't have to be anywhere. You know, I, no one knew how much I was drinking. And my housemates were drinking the same. You know, I'd drink a bottle of wine with me every night and had to, like, change their relationship with it and cut back. And I was like, oh, my God, I'm just getting started with this. Like, I really just getting started with this. And so I was drinking, like, this is crazy. I was drinking, like, a bottle of wine a night, like, easy two bottles of wine a night. And that quickly went from wine to hard liquor really fast. (laughs) And I was just like absolutely gripped by my eating disorder at the same time. And so I was just like, I was doing nothing. I was absolutely doing nothing. I was, I'd wake up in the morning, I'd drink coffee. That was the only thing I would drink. That was the only, even water made me so bloated. And so I would avoid drinking water. I was living on, on wine, basically. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I was, I was just, during the day, I did nothing. I went down to the beach with the dog and I'd stare at the horizon completely dissociated and feeling like I couldn't see properly and because I was not feeling myself properly. Then just every getting drunk every night or being drunk all the time. And I just, I remember... Keep, like kicking myself being like what is going on with me why why do I feel like I'm losing myself like where are all the parts of me going and um you know I never I never even considered that alcohol was like a problem I knew that, like not feeling myself was a massive issue and it was getting really bad I was purging every single meal absolutely everything I have this memory of, of being in like a truck stop toilet and I'd gone out for dinner with friends and, and I'd been I'd been purging so much that I was bleeding, had my head against the wall, I was tired. And I I was just like, I was like, how long is this gonna go for? I'm, I'm gonna die from the, from this. And I started feeling like I was gonna die from this. Just got back in the car with a bottle of, a bottle of wine and drank it in the car on the way home. And yeah, it, it, it was really bad. I did, I basically got to this point of my eating disorder where the jig was up and I, people started saying things, um, you know, my, my intention was never to lose weight. It was to just not feel this discomfort. And that eventually ended up turning into like, if I was when I felt discomfort and um, my body would just like go through this ritual and I was not conscious for it. Um, But yeah, people started to notice, people started to say things. And I remember driving my car and and looking at my arm and just like looking down and being like, there's nothing there. And it's really sad. I I was definitely like under 5% body fat I know it sounds crazy, but I had photos to prove it. It's absolutely terrifying. And I was just so lean, just so, so lean. I've since put on like over 20 kilograms, which is amazing. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, that, that, was, that was really terrible. I, I knew things were, had to change. So I, I started, you know, like slowly introducing things back into my, into my, um, yeah, I did all this research online and realized that like I could eat, you know, a certain amount of food and, and I just had to just work through it slowly. I did seek professional help, but as soon as that happened, we got hit by this, the Northern Rivers flood disaster. I don't know if you know, um, but Australia, a lot of the East Coast of Australia went through yeah. some pretty severe flooding uh, earlier this year. It was bad. I got trapped out on my property on this farm, the, all the bridges that were on the roads connecting to our property, um, they all collapsed. And I, I was trapped up there for five days, no food, no 
um, no power, no internet. I, I, I'd um, plugged my, <laughs> plugged the Wi-Fi uh, router into my car just so I could try to get some messages out. It was really bad. It was a really intense time. And I just dropped everything and spent like a month, just over a month, just shoveling out people's houses and, and trying to re recover their possessions. And it was just like, drop everything, all systems on this. And then through that, I just, after about a month of just volunteering, I just had a full mental health collapse. At that point, I was drinking all day, every day. You know, even as I was volunteering, I was having, you know, little shots of vodka and stuff just to get me through. And back to Melbourne, that's when it took it the biggest gear I ever could. And I was drinking all day, every day I was drinking at you know, getting better with my relationship with food, but I was drinking all the time. And I reached out to my friend and quite who had experienced some issues with alcohol and they recommended me an app. Um, and then that app very quickly led me to you. It was the first thing, like the very first thing that I found through that was um, this Naked Mind podcast. Mm -hmm. And I started listening to it. And at this, at this time, I was still drunk. Like I was still drinking every day but I was just listening to this podcast and um I was hooked immediately um and you know like things just started clicking in my head I realized I wasn't alone you know like um you know you you would mention something or one of your guests would mention something and I would just be like oh my god of course that's of course I'm waking up at 3 a.m. in the morning because my brain's going crazy, you know? Like everything started kind of making sense and I spent like two weeks trying to get that first day um, and then I made it and then I haven't gone back since, yeah. <laughs> wow. wow. Yeah. It's amazing. It's a bit of a long story. <laughs> no, it's perfect. Yeah. Oh man, what? So, how have things gone with food? Um, th things with food are are really good. I mean, there's there's a lot of things going. I I put on a lot of weight, um, and I've restored my weight and made a bit of extra little little chubbiness, which is cool. I'm happy with that. I yeah, I mean, I put on a third of my body weight in the in the last six months, and that is pretty crazy. That that's even possible things with food are, uh, are really good and I have to stress that I have not gone undergone any professional treatment I've done everything on my own I don't know if that's something to be proud of and I don't <laughs> and I'm not really sure um, maybe I could have gotten to where I am now faster with extra help so I would always encourage people to please ask for help I wish I did I really wish I did but yeah I, I think you know when I did start looking for help I realize that, especially around men, is, there's a, not a lot of research. That, I mean, maybe there is, but everything is quite female dominant. And um, that's okay. That's fine. But I just kept seeing these statistics and, and other things and being like, oh, well, that's, I'm not covered there. Like, you know, even just before, I was very, just trying to refresh my mind on the recovery rate statistics of, um, believe me in Nervesa and I could really only find it so it was um I found it was like quite under-resourced and there wasn't a lot of content or um, information online but I found a lot of help through the fitness industry and mm -hmm. it can be really toxic it's sometimes but it's really helped as as a male to um find like peers and uh you know, people to look up to the, you know, fully understand nutrition and, and, to, and to talk to you through what you need in the day and um, making friends at the gym and things like that have, have, has been really helpful. Um, and I, I think if it wasn't for, you know, like working out and going to the gym, I, I wouldn't be where I am right now. You know, I really wouldn't. Um, it's been that's been a really, really amazing um, resource for me, really. And I think, you know, being a lot more clear-minded without having alcohol in my life 
has really given me the leg up to be able to um, heal that relationship responsibly and, and, and healthily. Um, and that's, that's one thing that just like keeps coming back to me is like, if you get yourself to a better place, you're in a better position to help yourself. And you kind of just have to force yourself through those hard parts to get yourself to a, a better mind frame to be able to help yourself in a better way, in a way that you didn't imagine that you could, you know? Yeah. Um, and that just keeps coming up for me now. <laughs> That's so great. That's amazing. And then what would you say like is one of the hardest things about living alcohol free? Are you still involved in music or how is that? I am, I am. I mean, the thing is like, I'm slowly building my life back. Um, there is nothing in my life that alcohol and this eating disorder that coexisted together. It's very common that these things coexist, mm -hmm. but um, there's nothing that they didn't destroy. So they took away everything. My relationships, my relationships were failing. My sex drive out the window still is, is slowly coming back, but um, you know, my passions and hobbies and everything, you know, I love music, I've, I'm built for music and I, I just didn't want to do it anymore because of my abuse of um, abusing these substances. So I just like, these things are slowly coming back. I think people talk about like this uh, pink cloud, right? I didn't have that. I didn't have that at all. And I think, I think I was covering up a lot, a lot of trauma and a lot of things I didn't want to face. And when I removed alcohol, I, it was all still there, you know, and, mm -hmm. and it was, um, I had to face it. And that's been really challenging. It's been, uh, you know, remarkably challenging and getting through all that mental health, uh, all those mental health issues is, is, um, has been my focus up until now. And, you know, I, I bought a guitar, I bought some other things. They just, they're in my room and I'm just been looking at them, <laughs> like staring them down, I, you know, I haven't really played them. Um, and these, I'm, I'm starting to slowly see these things coming back, like little glimmers of life and um, my passion is coming back. But um, really for the last, you know, 100 days, um, my main focus and my main energy has just been on fully on recovery. And it's only been in this last fortnight, you know, the way it's so wonderful and amazing that I suggest it to everyone. And I do, <laughs> I've got to put it on now and, uh, and uh, I get a few minutes in and be like, you know what, maybe I'll just listen to some music, you know, and it's only now, it's only now that I feel like I can engage back in life again. Um, yeah, I I really didn't have <laughs> that that grace period at all. It was it was very challenging that those first few months. Yeah. Well, you seem very happy and full of life and upbeat, which is great. And yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm a happy I'm a happy guy. <laughs> That's awesome. And so yeah. was that present throughout or was it kind of missing and now coming back? Well, being, being happy. Mm -hmm. I, I, there was high, real, to be honest with you, there's some really highs. There's some real highs and some real lows. Um, uh, you know, I've always been a pretty happy person. I, you know, even when, when I was, um, really under the grips of alcohol. I think I, I got away with it for such a long time because everyone just thought I was fine, thought I was happy. Um, I was never like, even like, despite how much of the substance I was having, you know, I was, I was cooking food for everybody. Uh, I was making jokes, I was out at gigs, you know, night dancing on tables, you know, I was, a happy person. I never like broke anything or didn't have any DUIs or I didn't make any issues for myself. Um, you know, towards the end of the day, I, towards the end, I just got so drunk. I just sent myself home, you know? Um, 
So I think that definitely played a part in getting away with it for so long. Mm -hmm. um, I understand not, not everybody is like that, but um, yeah, I guess I'm lucky in that regard. <laughs> yeah, but it does yeah. it does have its you know underbelly of but that's really interesting. So, mm -hmm. oh, it's such a good story. I appreciate it so much. Um, and let me ask you sort of the question that I always ask at the end, which is if you were going to go back in time and talk to Maxie, who is really, really stuck and really suffering um, yeah. in some of, you know, the worst moments, what would you tell him about what life is like now? Oh, wow. It's, it's really hot. That is, I've, I've thought about that question a lot, honestly, because I've listened to your podcast. <laughs> You're like, you know, you know I, I, I don't think you understand that your podcast has been my best friend for the past few months so um yeah I I really don't know what I would say to him you know I think I got here uh for a reason I can't see any other path um and even still I can't I can't change that you know I can't change my path but um I don't know. I'd, pro I'd probably just give him a big hug, I'd say. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I wish I knew, I, I guess the point, right, is I, I, I guess I wish I knew how much it would take from me. And I, th I really think if I knew that, that would have really, maybe I could have got in earlier, you know, maybe I could have got in earlier because it really took everything. Sorry, <laughs> I don't want to get emotional, <laughs> but it really did. And, um, and uh, I'm fighting every day to get those things back. So um, I think I would tell him how much this, um, this can take and, and um, how, much, how hard you're going to have to work to get it back. And then let, let him weigh up <laughs> weigh it off and, and see if it's going to be worth it yeah I love that oh super proud of you yeah. I think thank you <laughs> uh yeah it's been it's been a it's been a crazy time um but I I really I'm I really have to thank you really you led me on on such an incredible path and I have such a scientific mind, Annie. Like I, I need to like understand. I need to like I love I'm, the work you've done with you know when you have other healthcare professionals or on the podcast because I just need that. Like I need to hear um, someone, the well versed and educated. Um, even though all the anecdotal anecdotal stuff is amazing. Um, yeah, I need to hear those, that stuff. And um, you've led me on to other podcasts and other resources that have been really helpful as well, um, like the Recovery Elevator and um, Hip Sobriety and just, just like the whole recovery community that I just didn't realise existed. Yeah, I, I, I can't thank you enough. Like you've actually saved my life. You really, really have. I know people say that all the time, because you probably do <laughs> but um well you yeah. for sure did that I I cannot take any credit for that but oh I, but you should <laughs> <laughs> that was all you that was all. no I just like um when when they write, write all the history books at the end of time they'll be like oh yeah and actually you know he'd be nothing without any so mm -hmm. um Thank you. <laughs> really, thank you. You're so welcome. Thank you so much for coming on. And thanks for sharing so vulnerably about the eating disorder and stuff. I remember in, um, in college, I was working at a pizza place and I would just, you know, forget to eat. And then I would just like eat a ton of pizza while I was waitressing. Yeah. And it would make me feel so sick. And then I yeah. just throw it up and I was like, oh, this is perfect. So I can eat yeah. a ton of 
the, and then I can just throw it up and then it's no big deal. And I, it lasted, I, I had this specific job just for a summer. So it was summer of, I forget what, probably my sophomore year of college. And, um, and it was a, a specific restaurant I remember so vividly. And towards the end of the summer, I remember being in the bathroom and it, it just seemed convenient. Like that was like where it started. It just seemed convenient. Yeah. Oh, this yeah. is like, you know, like you feel so hungry and then getting really full feels really good until it doesn't feel really good. And then it feels really terrible. And then you're That's like, right. fix that mistake. And yeah, it just felt so convenient. And, and then I remember just having this little whisper in my ear in the mm. bathroom, like, don't go here. This is, this is not for you. And, and just, you need to treat food with gratitude and this is not gratitude. And um, just this like intense all or nothing conviction. And I would be lying if I said that, you know, especially when you overeat, if it didn't cross my mind, I was 20, probably 19 or 20. And yeah. ever since then, like that voice was just so strong and I feel so grateful. I feel so grateful because I, it's like, it's like so many things, like even getting a prescription for Vicodin and having it run out and being like, wow, I just had a really good week. Like, why do I feel? So? And then just being like, oh, that, that is not a path you want to go down. And obviously yeah. well down the alcohol path, well down the marijuana. Yeah. Path. yeah. <laughs> I consider myself very grateful to not have seen, you know, it's almost like you see the train and you're like, this train is going to crash. Yeah. And, yeah. and just having the foresight to be like, okay, I'm going to get off it sooner. Now that obviously did not happen for me with alcohol I had to yeah. take that all the way to the crash, but. Wow. Yeah. I think you're so really fortunate, like, you know, you're so fortunate to have had that little whisper. Um, I think what like a lot of people don't realize, or I at least didn't realize is these things are, I hope you don't mind me swearing, but they are nasty and cheeky motherfuckers, you know? Right. They slide and creep their way in. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you go from one, you know, oh, I've overeaten and I've had, uh, you know, too much and uh, I'm just going to purge because it's, it'll make me feel better to sitting in your house alone smashed off your face on hard liquor watching cooking every single night because your body is so hungry <laughs> um it is like searching for food but you're not wired properly or like because you're not nourishing your pro yourself properly you're not making good decisions you know i think that's that's the thing about a lot of these things is like you put yourself you put your body under so much stress you sure as hell aren't going to be in a great, a great place to help yourself out, you know? And I think that's why people need to ask for help so goddamn much and why I wish I did. But you can, um, yeah, you, you, that's a, such a slippery slope, you know? And I wouldn't have identified with having an eating disorder, but towards the end there, like, everything started adding on, you know? Um, these, like, frantic energies in the morning where you wake up with just, like, this crazy adrenaline hit and you're just like go 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 and you think you just have all this energy but really it's just your body just like pumping your body full of adrenaline to have enough energy to go find food that's what it's trying to do for you um and so like i don't know everything everything you could possibly think of i, I was you know i was biting food and spitting it out i was watching cooking videos or food videos or fitness videos 24 7 I was trying to work out all the time it just like it just turned into like life consuming um and this yeah it's just such a slippery slope I, I wish that I had that small little voice or like the education in my mind to be like okay like this is this is gonna ruin your life Maxie <laughs> um I shouldn't laugh at myself about that. That's really terrible. But yeah, it's such a slippery slope. It really is. It really is. Yeah, laughter is okay. I feel like we have to take this somewhat lightly. Otherwise, we'll just drown with it. You know, I feel like. Oh my God, I know, right? Yeah. 
<laughs> I have to, I genuinely have to laugh at this. Um, maybe I'm just in hysterics because I can't believe I survived it, honestly. <laughs> It's so it's so interesting because it's like you hear stories when you when you haven't had any experience in that arena, right? Like, mm. like I'm trying to think of a story like where I've had no experience, and um, I feel like I've had a lot of experience, so maybe I don't. But I I know that yeah. you hear stories and you're like, well, how could you possibly? Like, how yeah. could a human being possibly? But then you find yourself in the midst of it, and it's, it's not one little decision. It's just this cumulative slide and like suddenly, mm. and, and, and by the way, if anybody's listening and they're wondering, how could you possibly trust us? We are wondering that about ourselves time to 10. <laughs> like, yeah. sure. yeah. like, how could I possibly? Like, <laughs> how could I possibly do that? Yeah. yeah. How could I possibly go weeks without eating like a proper meal? Like, like how is that even scientifically possible? I don't understand that, but yeah, I don't know. It's just and I remember the sleep. day the I wasn't purging anymore. You know that had been something that had kind of like squashed. But I remember for sure living yeah. off coffee and wine. Yeah, and, yeah, that know, was my diet. <laughs> can see photos um, of myself where I was like, you know, when your head just looks like kind of too big for your body, and it was like circa 2012, and just international and and it's funny when you do that like my appetite for food actually didn't exist like it wasn't like I was trying not to eat it was just yeah like, I don't know if there's just so many calories in wine or what was happening or if if my body was in some sort of starvation or a totally yeah. filter or like adrenals were shot I don't know what was happening but I remember sitting in front of food and not actually being able to eat it like it wasn't like yeah. I was trying to ignore yeah. or trying not to feed myself. Yeah, I think there is something there. I, I'm not really certain on the facts here, but I know I, you know, it does make sense that if uh, you are really small in terms of your uh, body weight, um, you probably you will require a lot less energy to sustain that. So um, you know, it does make sense that your appetite would go down if you're if you're really underweight. Um, just as much as it makes sense that your appetite goes up when you put on a lot of weight. Um, so there, there's probably a, an element to that as well, but I think just the way our, our brains are just not working properly at that point, you know, yeah. we're not making any good decisions about it. Yeah. <laughs> like nothing. I'm surprised I dressed so well back then. I looked amazing, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> God, you'd already I bought your clothes didn't. they were just on they were ready you're like yeah actually i'm <laughs> autopilot I'm straight up lying to you no one wears clothes in fire day you just <laughs> oh yeah that's true i know this to be true that's, that's absolutely true um oh wow the amount of times i turned up to work without a shirt on and it was fine it's just ridiculous it shouldn't be allowed <laughs> <laughs> surfer culture surfer yeah culture. but um, yeah i think I mean, like, yeah, eat, eating the eating disorder is a real challenge. I feel like I, I really got doubled down on there. Um, and I know, you know, life just happens, you know, um, and nothing really happens to you. Life just happens and you just go with it. And, uh, yeah, I think I just had to, had to deal with it. Um, it was such a bloody challenge. But um, yeah, especially as a man, I think um, I was so scared, you know, I had, I actually like was fortunate enough to, I don't know if you can call it fortunate, but I had a few peers who were struggling with eating disorders as well. And they were men and, um, you know, we talked about it some, some ways, but in the grand, grand scheme of things, I felt so alone. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, all the research, I, as, as soon as I, I tried to look for some resources or studies online, um, I, I just felt left out of that, you know. Mm -hmm. I felt really, really scared and really alone in it. And, um, you know, I was hiding it from everybody because I knew that, you know, I knew it wasn't okay. And, um, 
yeah, I, I, I just hope we can really push away the stigma um, around eating or just any sort of, um, yeah, any, any kind of problem that, <laughs> that deserves a recovery because um, I think a lot of people are so scared away from, from asking for help. I, I really struggled to ask for help, you know. Mm. I think um, growing up, growing up as a as a male, you only you know I can't I shouldn't generalize like this, but yeah, I, you only go to the doctors when something seriously is going wrong. You know, you know when you have that like I can't help myself, I can't sleep my way out of this one. <laughs> um, and that would that were the only times I went to like see a doctor. And even still, when I went to see doctors, they I was met with such low like such low levels of emotional intelligence that I just felt like I just wasted my money and um didn't really get heard um I did I remember going to see a general practitioner once and he said to me he's like um yeah so you're still alive and you're still you're still functioning so you must be going okay check back in a couple of weeks and I was, I was trying to open up about my relationship with food and how I felt like something was going wrong um, because I was purging all the time. That was years ago. I actually fully forgot that happened mm. until just now. <laughs> so maybe I did get let down by the system a little bit. But I think if we remove this stigma and I think if we, like, really let people know that it's okay to, like, to deal with these problems, um, uh I think we could get a lot further, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And I think also just, I don't know, there's something that you've said a few times that I just want to like talk about a little bit is like mm. um, wishing that it wouldn't have gotten so hard. And while I fully understand that so much, I also know the view from many years rec recovered, whatever that means, mm. we're all dealing with some yeah. sort of Wrap all the time, but I don't think that that works. But yeah, <laughs> I'm like <laughs> years distant from the poignant thing, like the acute things. In uh, yes, and um, and I'll tell you that I think that you really can see the tapestry from the other side. You know, like when you're when you're in it and you just you feel the chaos and like the the regret and the frustration and and it's hard to see like why did this have to happen to me? Why couldn't I have, you know, navigated this differently. Like, you know, you said life just happens. It doesn't happen to you. But like, I think you could take that one step further and, and just really say like, I think it does ultimately happen for you and um, for you in a way that might not feel accessible yet, but in a way that whatever you're going to do with all of this, all of this knowledge, all of this understanding, all of this, like, um, whether to just talk to a few people or a few hundred thousand as we're talking to right now or whatever the case is, like it's it's really powerful. Like it's for a reason. And I I don't know, yeah. maybe a bit woo-woo, but I believe that. Wow, you are uh, you have a re remarkable talent to frame things so positively. <laughs> <laughs> and I love that. I I can I can I hold on to that because I, I think I love that. Um yeah. Yeah, you're so right. <laughs> and and it, so I think right. it will become more and more apparent. You know what I mean? It doesn't. Yeah. I, I certainly didn't feel like that a few hundred days into. Yeah. I mean, I was encouraged um, in, the, in the first hundred days where I, all I'd heard is these you know, stories of people feeling like they're like, oh, my God, I got my life back. Everything's I'm seeing clearer and all these things. Um, just sitting here with my head in my hands and my in my youth being like, oh my god, everything is real. <laughs> and um, it was fucking terrifying, and that was really hard. And I was, I've been waiting for it to to get better. And um, I guess everyone has their own journey. And, and um, really, now in these in these last couple of weeks, as I've started living again, like. I, I finally, I'm sitting in my new house. I finally got a house um, post floods. Um, 
I don't own it. I'm renting, but <laughs> oh, it's the first time I've had a home in six months um, since the flood. So it's pretty exciting. Um, but yeah, now I'm sitting in this house and, and looking back at it and feeling so much the wiser. Um, and yeah, it, it it did. It just took some time, and um, you know, I def I definitely I definitely don't feel um. I'm, um I don't feel like I've got my whole life back together. I think that's still happening every day. But um, yeah, you you definitely can look back and um, and and realize like the night and day. But I've learned so much in the process. I feel like I have a bachelor degree in in my own body now, um, and I can't believe I survived this long without one because I really needed that. <laughs> so good to know I mean, what's happening with you <laughs> so I love that. yeah yeah oh totally yeah I mean god recovery has to be one of the the best things that could that could have happened to me when I <laughs> when I actually think about it now I, I feel so um educated to be able to tackle the rest of my life or whatever I have left of it <laughs> so, um yeah I'm really thankful to be a part of this recovery community. Um, I think it's all, I'm not, I'm not, I'm just, I'm, I'm just, uh, I just consume it, you know. But that makes sense. We're all part of it. So I, I, I cannot believe that I, like, that I'm talking to you right now. It's just, it's, I have to keep myself every, every couple of seconds. <laughs> yeah. It's been such a pleasure and it's so, uh, yeah, just super courageous and brave and, and what a cool thing to have heard the podcast and then mm. come on the podcast. So oh, if there's yeah. any listeners who are like, I want to share, like, it's such a gift. I know it can be hard, but it's such a gift to share your story. Yeah. Oh, such a gift. Such a gift. And I also, I'm, I, I'm getting tired of boring all of my friends and co-workers. Um, <laughs> I'm sure. I like I'm I'm sure they're really proud of me. I'm just getting tired of telling everybody <laughs> what it's like. Um, so it's really cool to be, have this space. Um, yeah, thank thank you, Annie. And uh, it's it's just like just so incredible just to see you. I just feel so fiercely lucky um, and fortunate to, to have had this. So, yeah. Oh, so do I. I. Feel really fortunate to meet you too. Thank you so much. Cool. <laughs> hey, maybe I'll do something really cool one day and um, you can be like, yeah. I knew someone. <laughs> I love that. Let's plan on that. That sounds like Yeah. Hey, I think I'm capable now. I think I think I think you I'm in the right whole life ahead of you. All sorts of talent. Yeah. Can't wait to watch. It's just gonna be <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dude, I do want to write a James Bond score one day. That's my oh. that's my life goal, I think. Even though that looking back, that piece of uh, the Bond films, I don't know if you've watched the early Bond films, they're some of the most misogynist things I've ever seen in my entire life, good Lord. But <laughs> I've always wanted to write a Bond song. So maybe I'll get there one day, hopefully. <laughs> I love that. Sounds great. <laughs> Please don't forget to check out This Naked Mind companion app in the App Store on Google Play or online at thisnakedmindapp.com. More than 700 Q&A videos, the alcohol experiment, our global community, and so much more. Private, off social media, and free. All in one place and conveniently tucked right in your back pocket. I really hope to see you there. Thisnakedmindapp.com. And as always, rate, review, and subscribe to this podcast as it truly helps the message reach somebody who might need to hear it today.